Hello, mate. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 290. That's dos nueve ocho, dos nueve zero. Sorry, not ocho, because ocho is eight. Dos nueve ocho. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Good to hear. I'm live and direct from somewhere in East London, streaming direct to you via YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube Premiere, big up you. Smash that like button and leave me a comment in the chat. If you're listening to it via the podcast app, after the fact, thank you for listening either. Thank you for listening to actually. Leave me a five-star review, please, and share. That'll be great. That's all I ask of you. All right? That's all I ask of you. I'm not going to start crying, but yeah. Um, but wherever you're listening to, wherever you are, wherever you're at, holler at your boy. How you doing? How you feeling? How you doing? As per usual, the Action Zinger Show is your number one source for streetwear, music, culture, um, night nightlife stuff, uh, current you know events, tech news, all that stuff in between. You'll find it right here on the Action Zinger Show. You can find out more regarding myself on my website, actionzinger.com. The link will be in the description. That's agostinozinger.com, all one word. You'll find gig listings for myself because I DJ part-time. You'll also find my blog, which I write every single day. I have a new entry on my blog post, so check that out. You'll find out my Instagram details on there, which is actionzinger as well, all one word. You'll find out my Twitter account too, actionzinger, one word. And you'll find contact details for me if you want to send me an email, wherever it may be. So, let's get into the show, innit? Loads of stuff to talk about. Who... I've been pretty good. I've been I've been feeling amazing. Uh, I know no one asked, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> um, I've had a pretty constructive week uh, so far. I've been running and training a lot. I've been um, I think I mentioned it before, right? I, I've got like a target of doing ten miles a week. So ten miles a week at the moment is essentially breaking up to about three runs of like four miles and plus, or I do a couple of fives and then maybe one, you know, one uh, kind of like a uh, sprint or sort of like lap thing around the area where I live in, about 200, 400 meters, so that's quite cool, and then I think from next week, I'm going to pump it up a bit, and then go to 15, and then hopefully go to 20, and then um, get to a point where I'm just doing 20 miles consistently every week, and I found that to be pretty, uh, a good, um, a really good balance to the weight training I'm doing now at the moment at the gym, because I've been doing a lot of weight training, and I feel like I'm getting a lot more bigger than I need to be for running purposes, and obviously maybe my diet too needs to be looked at, I need to get a bit more, more strict with it, because essentially running, you only get better at running from running, that's one thing obviously I've kind of, you know, been very much, uh, it's been drilled into me ever since I started running a few years ago, the way to get better at running is to run more, there's loads of programs out there that kind of tell you, there's some programs out there, not loads, but there's some programs out there that advocate the idea of like, oh, don't run like this, don't run, don't do long runs, just do small ones and then you can do a long run on your race day, but at the end of the day, if you want to get that cardiovascular um, endurance up, you want to ensure that your muscles and your limbs are able to carry you those long distances for a long period of time, you just have to run more, the more you run, the better you get, I kind of equate it a little bit to skateboarding, I remember when I first started skating, like the, the summer that you have where you're just like outside skating every single day, you get really good really quickly, I remember that was one something for me, I got really good at skateboarding very quickly, then the moment you stop, and you, you know, there's a six month gap in between because, you know, life took over or you're just lazy or the weather conditions changed and you try to get back on the skateboard, just pushing it down the street can be difficult. And I think running is the same sort of thing. Like the moment you take a break from it and you just start lifting weights or just go to the gym regularly, you'll notice how hard it is. I, I know it's the same sort of correlation with most cardio exercises, even similar to like, um, going on a rowing machine, for instance, when I'm on the rowing machine, when I was doing rowing machine, like every other day in the gym. And then now I jump back onto it. I'm struggling to do like three sets of 500s. You know what I mean? Meters, it just really, really takes a lot out of you. So at the moment, I'm just trying to run a lot, try and do it consistently to a good enough level that I can get back to the level that I was previously because, you know, I was really fast before. I used to just smash my 10Ks under 40 minutes and shit. Now at the moment, I'm still under, I'm, I'm around the 50 minute mark. So I have to shave off a good 10 minutes in my time. And that's obviously going to come down to the fact that I need to lose a little bit of weight. I need to run more and to get stronger, get quicker. And my endurance needs to go up and it needs to be. That's been that in terms of training. And then um, apart from that, you know, been DJing at home a lot, recording some mixes I'm going to upload onto my SoundCloud very soon. So check that out. So keep an eye out for that, actually. Um, my SoundCloud, I think it's Handsome Black Man, right? I'm pretty sure it's is it Handsome Black Man. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it's Handsome Black Man, all one word, on my SoundCloud. So check that out, too. There'll be a new mix on there uploaded very, very soon. I'll let you guys know when that happens. I'm also putting up a lot more content on my Instagram page for my DJing stuff. So check that out, too. That's handsome.blackman. Uh, is it handsome? Yeah? Handsome, all one word, dot black man, right? I think, or something like that. It doesn't matter, really. I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check it out later. But that's about it, really. That's about it for me. Um, Just living life and trying to do the damn thing. Um, So here we go. Um. Let's get into some topics because, you know, 
there's no point running around um, and kind of skirting around the issue. Loads of stuff to talk about, things I want to get into and all that malarkey. So, um, topic number one to get into, right? There's this, uh, where, where is this lady? Have you heard about, so the coronavirus has obviously overtaken everything. I think a lot of people have been speaking about it recently. Um, it's been a topic of conversation within the electronic music space. Just because I think there's a lot of money involved. It seems like there's a lot of stakeholders involved in the running of the successful running of an event. So I guess there's a lot of things to look out for and everyone's trying to protect their nut. No one wants to be in a position where they're like calling something off and then suddenly it gets rectified a week later. So everyone's kind of like um, holding court and trying to make sure uh, nothing crazy happens. Let's see if I can find the update. There's an update thread that they posted. Yeah, this is the one, yeah, right? So everyone's trying to hold court and not be too um, nervy with it, right? Um, and I guess for me personally, it's been quite difficult to kind of like look at this stuff because it's like, in electronic music space is sort of like equating like it's like, it's like that Nastia post I posted the other day or I spoke about on my podcast the other day right when Nastia made a DJ Nastia actually she made a post about you know um, wanting her gigs in Milan to go through because it's one of the best clubs she's been to and then sharing pictures of herself looking cute like you know it's quite me 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 it's quite self-absorbed it's very narcissistic um and just again, it just goes to highlight just how uh, lacking in empathy people are in general, right? People are just trying to look after themselves. No one really gives a shit about, you know, people across the world dying from this virus. People would just much rather be able to get to their destination on time. They want to be able to meet their friends. They want to be able to go to this festival, hang out at this place, whatever. There's no real, there's no real consideration for the other people involved in this who are being affected by it in a really, really um, bad way. Uh, but Resident Advisor did a really good job of kind of collating all the information so far in dance music world. I think that the something we've heard so far is that so far, I think Italy's locked down. Uh, Coachella's been postponed until October, it looks like. Um, and there may be a few other festivals coming up that will be affected too. I think most likely, most, more likely than not, if the coronavirus ends up uh, spreading across the UK, we end up getting the same amount of... Um, cases springing up as they did maybe in northern part of italy i assume things like junction which i intend to go to this summer will also be called off i'm assuming place things like houghton that was called off last year due to severe winds will definitely get called off again this year so all those things will just there'll be a a real lockdown in terms of uh these uh what do you call it these public events right because i think they're debating the same thing about sports too football they're saying they want to play a lot of the games behind closed doors which is insane really considering most of the clubs get their main amount of revenue through the gate on the match day so the fact that they're doing it behind closed doors is essentially going to hamstrung the, some of the clubs who aren't uh financially stable as others um it's going to mean that you know they're going to be put in a perilous position uh the games are not going to be good it's not great motivation for the players to be subjected to, you know, to be required to play a game um, behind closed doors because there's a virus going around, but everyone else has to stay at home. You know, it's not the best mindset to put professional athletes in. Um, you want to make their job as easy as it can, right? And then you've got that hanging over their head. And in general, I just think, you know, if Italy has kind of postponed the league, I think, until the June or July, until everything kind of calms down, I think the Premier League just have to just follow suit. But again, too many stakeholders involved who are, have a you know big financial interest in these organizations or in these kind of things taking place and it just it's just going to show how you know deep the capitalist um kind of uh tentacles are attached to all these things that we know and love right um they're really showing their true colors here but anyway let's go into the resident advisor article it did a good job of kind of collating all the information so far and it's very interesting to see like what's kind of what's currently going on and how they aim to kind of sort it out so this is from Resident Advisor. I'll put up here on screen for you guys to see. Um, it says here, coronavirus latest. Um, everything we know about the novel coronavirus, aka COVID nineteen, is affecting the music, right? So we'll scroll down. Let's go from like the let's go from like the six, right? So I posted here. So the six says here. Um, a note posted on the South by Southwest website on March 6th indicated the city of Austin has cancelled in March date for South by Southwest. So South by Southwest, if you, any of you guys know, most of you would know if you're watching this show that. You know, it's the premier place for launching a startup and launching a music career, right? People go there. People from, you know, all walks of life have kind of gone there, secured funding, um, secured investment. Um, maybe got a mentor on, or, on board. Maybe have been able to kind of, you know, get a new fan base, sign a record label. There's so many things that have happened off the back of South by Southwest. It's like, you know, the number one cultural event to go to if you're up and coming. So for them to cancel South by Southwest is a big deal because I'm assuming there's a lot of big industries, a lot of big uh, brands tied to it. I'm assuming people like MasterCard and Visa and all that sort of shit. 
are sponsoring that kind of event. So for them to cancel it now is obviously a big blow. But again, it's a very good precaution measure. So I think that was one of the big heavyweights to kind of uh, fall by the wayside due to the coronavirus. And I think that was the one where everyone kind of took notice and thought, okay, maybe this thing is serious. If they're canceling South by Southwest, it means stuff like Coachella, for instance, which is, you know, they're in talks about postponing it until I think, was it October or something, right? They're going to be affected. But the thing that's really interesting to me about it is, is that the postponement, it's not only going to affect them in the you know in the interim for now at the moment. It's also going to affect them in the future because even if you postpone Coachella until October, it's no guarantee people are actually going to come out for it, right? Um, a lot of the Coachella fans or a lot of fans that go to maybe not South by Southwest are probably a bit more of an older crowd, but I would imagine Coachella fans for the most part, uh, most of the attendees that go there are usually young kids, right? Young girls maybe under the age of like 25, maybe still living at home. For the most part, no parent would be confident, will be comfortable allowing their child to go to a festival like that with this virus, you know, still in the air. They wouldn't want it. Of course, you know, the kids are going to do what they want to do. If they want to sneak out and go, if they want to defy their parents, they'll go regardless. But I think a lot of parents will have it, will try and try their best to this, uh, you know, uh, dissuade their kids from going to an event like this, especially, you know, a festival where, you know, it's not the most hygienic of places in the best of times, right? Let alone when this virus is spreading. Uh, so it says the following here about South by Southwest. We're devastated to share this news with you. The show must go on. It's in our DNA. And this is the first time in 34 years that the March event will not take place. Jesus Christ. It reads, adding in the festival honours and respects the city's decision. So again, it wasn't even the South by Southwest that decided to cancel it. It was actually the city of Austin that said, hey, this has to go off which is, again, another side indictment of just how short-sighted some of these event promoters are. Um, we continue here from March 9th. Update. Golden Voice, the promoter behind the Coachella Valley uh, Music and Art Festival, is in talks to move the massive two-weekend festival to October the 16th and 23rd, which, you know, if you're familiar with Coachella, I think they started this maybe a couple of years ago during the whole um, uh, double weekenders, um, which I've never... I, I assume it's just a monetary thing, right? I'm assuming they just make so much money or they sell so many tickets the first weekend that they just, and the demand is so high. It's like the premier influencer, Instagram-ready, TikTok-ready platform to go to, especially if you're a young kid trying to get involved in that industry. And just in general, it's LA, it's glitzy, it's fun, it's cool. So maybe that's why they did it. But you don't really hear other festivals doing that, right? Where they have like a back-to-back -back festival following weekend. It's not really a thing that happens, which is, you know, pretty cool concept. But now they're aiming to push it back to October, which is, you know, not the same thing. But obviously, LA's got the... The benefit of never being cold really um the weather's still going to be beautiful the flights are probably be cheaper in october than it would be in april anyway going forward people can plan it still there's still enough time to plan ahead um your ticket will probably still be valid for the october day anyway as well so there's loads of things in their favor in that regard but again i'm just not too sure what's going to happen with the attendees like who's actually going to turn up who's going to be confident enough to go to an event like coachella with this in the air i don't know um there, there, there are four active kind of um kind of coronavirus cases in uh, Riverdale, uh, Riverside County, sorry, where the site festival is in, is in IDO, in, is located. Um, okay, as following news here, all of Italy will be placed under lockdown starting from March 10th, which is today, as part of a decree by the Prime Minister Giuseppe Conti, conditions already imposed on Northern Italy will be extended to the entire country. Um, some 60 million people, which includes pro uh, prohibition on all non-essential travel and the closure of nightclubs, venues, gyms and other gathering places. Jesus Christ. You just forget how how much of a social creature we are and stuff and this happens, isn't it? Every gathering place, essentially everywhere apart from your own home, is completely off off limits. I think there was a picture someone tweeted earlier on, you know, of like the streets of Italy being completely deserted. Um, yeah, it's a very, very um, crazy time. And then next year, we've got Get Lost. 24-hour Miami party planned for March 21st has been postponed, of course. March 9th announcement says, a new location for the event that we've been working on for six months in based in the district of Hilai, Hilali, something, where city officials announced an, a ban on all public gatherings due to the fear of COVID-19 virus spreading. And then lastly here for the March 9th news, we've got the French government has banned events with more than 1,000 people from March 8th through to April 13th. Le Monde reports heightening its previous call to halt 5,000 capacity events. Concrete's brick code express frustration with the move. Which, why would they have... Let me just... Why are they frustrated about this move? Just to hear what their opinion is on this one. Uh, brick Le Cree, huh? All 1,000 events are forbidden in France from now on. French scene, RIP. Uh, you can't really say that again. It's not is what it is, isn't it? 
it's not again it's not that it's not about the scene this is about humanity man there's people in like rural parts of china like dying left right and center right i think it's kind of like stalled a bit the death count but people are still dying from a virus that they had no idea existed a couple of months ago or just a few weeks ago it's not really about the scene really at this point in time it's about something bigger than that but you know i understand people's uh reluctance to look at it that way especially when you're got some money involved in it but hey uh next year we've got a berlin venue uh trauma bar in kino has cancelled all its upcoming events in march which is, again which i showed you but i said before when i was in when i went to Berghain earlier i did say in my video about Berghain that i did get the impression that it was a lot emptier than it had been previously like it did take long to go in like usually when i queue at like you know because the peak time to go to Bel uh, to go to Bergen is usually Sunday morning, which is why they call it church. Sunday morning, uh, between the hours of like let's say four a.m. and nine a.m. or four a.m. and eight a.m. That's the peak time to go in. It's usually no queue. You can stay there until the Monday morning. Um, but it was completely empty. No, I won't say completely empty, but the queue was a lot smaller than it had been previously. Uh, it didn't extend up until the Curry Works place, just probably just until the middle of it, until the middle of the kind of like the runway towards the club. Um, the club was fairly empty. There was a lot of room. You could dance around. I made my way all the way to the front of the decks, which I never did previously. It's always too packed to even walk to the front. I never even see what the booth looks like in Bergen because it's that so it's that packed. This time I could actually see what the booth looked like in both places. Panorama Bar maybe was a bit more fuller than uh, Bergen, but that might be due to the lineup. Yeah, it did seem as if uh, Bergen was a lot quieter than it had been in previous times I've been. But again, um, I'm not there every day. I'm not there every week. Maybe it was just an off week. I don't know. It continues here. Uh, winter music conference uh, will not take place in 2020 billboard reports following the cancellation of ultra music festival the postponement of guest of miami party and then lastly here lastly here we got uh, katrina barbary has cancelled her up and coming u.s tour as well as it is lockdown she was due to play five shows between march 18th and 28th including stops in dallas los angeles and new york but i'm assuming because italy is suffering what they can and she obviously lives in italy i'm assuming you know they're not allowing her to travel out and it's just not safe in it so again um, a very hectic time uh, a very crazy time again uh, sympathies do go out to a lot of the artists and stuff because i'm assuming as post human spoke about in his previous tweet i mentioned in the other podcast it does seem like the number one time to go the the main money earner for a lot of these acts is to go on tour um and perform at these festivals and stuff especially since festival seasons you know starting a lot sooner than it would have done in previous years but there must be bigger things out there than you know than the scene to worry about at the moment. You know I mean, people are dying left, right, and center. We need to kind of contain this virus, and hopefully, um, there's a solution or some sort of a vaccine gets found um, during the interim, and then you know people can go back to their regular scheduled programming. But until then, let's uh, let's help each other out. Okay, next on the list, I want to go through here. What else I want to speak about? Da, 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 da. Oh, actually, um, there's this interesting story about a Vietnamese jet setter just tying in coronavirus. Uh, a Vietnamese jet setter with coronavirus, a guest of a top uh, a guest of top fashion shows in Maryland, Paris. Wealthy 27-year-old attended uh, Gucci Saint Laurent catwalk shows before testing positive for coronavirus upon a return to Vietnam. Hundreds of people attended each of the shows and fashion editors and buyers who returned from Milan and Paris have gone into self-quarantine. So again, they all probably was in the same venue as her. They might have shared a drink. They might have shared a handshake. It's just... It's absolutely nutty, isn't it, that somebody... But again, I have sympathy for the girl because maybe she didn't know she had it, but the carelessness and the recklessness to actually go out there knowing what's happening, uh, maybe she thought because she's a, you know, an affluent like, young lady, she lives away from the slums, maybe that's why she didn't think that she had the contact of the virus, but the amount of people that she put into jeopardy just for going to a fashion show is really, really bad. Um, and I think she deleted that Instagram too, so they might show that might be an indication of some level of guilt because... If she didn't, if she was honestly an honest mistake, and you just not his mistake, if it was honestly an oversight, then I don't necessarily see the point of deleting your Instagram, right? Because you just went, you didn't know you had the virus. But I think deletion of Instagram it might be an indication of guilt in some respects. Anyway, this is an article from South China Morning Post. It says the following: A wealthy Japanese, sorry, a wealthy Vietnamese uh, jet setter who tested positive for coronavirus after a trip to Europe attended luxury catwalk shows at Fashion Weeks in Milan and Paris. Among the events. Uh, Ga Gunyun, is it? Uh, is it Nga Nugunyun or is it Ga Guyun? I wonder if the N is silent. Anyway, uh, 27 is known to have attended um, were fashion shows by Saint Laurent and Gucci in Milan. She documented her attendance on, at the Fashion Week shows, including the two shows on her now deleted Instagram account. According to Vietnamese media, the Go Train Ga, who is based between Vietnam and London, is the daughter of a steel magnate. Uh, Ga visited uh, Europe with her sister. Uh, Hong Nyung 
26, who also tested positive for coronavirus. Paris Fashion Week attracts thousands of visitors from all over the world to the French capital, but the Saint, Milan, the Saint Laurent show would have sex guest list, which approximately which normally capped at about a thousand people. Jesus Christ. Uh, top Milan fashion editors and department store buyers who attended the Paris and Fashion Weeks are still in self-imposed quarantine after returning to their home countries. It's mad though because I know a lot of um, fashion companies are still running an extremely tight ship and not allowing their staff to work from home. They still request them to come in. Like fashion is one of the last places where they can still crack that whip like that and people are not going to uprise and, and protest and hoot and holler because, you know, if you kick up a fuss in the fashion company that you want to work from home and you don't think it's safe, they're going to replace you in an instant. They, all they got to do is put out a tweet about wanting a new account manager or wanting a new uh, assistant or wanting a new PR director, social media manager, and you're out of a job in a, in a flash. Do you know what I mean? So no one's wanting to risk it. So the fashion companies are taking a piss of it and just still requiring people to come into work, especially in places where there are um, cases of the coronavirus spreading like wildfire. They don't give an absolute shit. So that's the, that's the kind of sad part about being involved in fashion. The good part is that you get to, you know, you get to be in the fashion week, you get to hang around, you get to, fight, you know, get to talk to all your idols, people you look up to. But then the sad part of it is that, you know, the company can also demand that you uh, attend the show still. You still come into the office, you have to take meetings. It's absolutely nutty. Anyway, um, da, 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 da. so um, editors from the United States and from Asian countries such as Singapore and Thailand have confirmed that their companies have asked them not to return to the offices after visiting Milan, which is in Lombardy region of Italy. The country with a large number of, of cases outside of the Asia. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. On Sunday, Northern Italy, including Lombardy, was a placed under lockdown to curb the spread of the virus. Wow. Where is England on that list? So, obviously, mainland China, Italy's second. So, the, the chances of England being on lockdown is probably quite low because the, there's not a lot of cases. The cases are still in the hundreds, right? We've got 320 here and five deaths, whereas Italy has uh, 463 deaths and 9,172 cases. So, I'm, I'm assuming... Uh, there's still there's there's not going to be a chance that we're going to be in lockdown. I don't think so. France and Spain the same sort of thing. Right, so continues the case here. Uh, Vietnam has now re so far reported twenty nine cases of the coronavirus. The post uh, was not at Milan Fashion Week where the Gucci show took place, but attended the Saint Laurent show held in a very large venue where the guests sat close together. As a res respiratory disease, the coronavirus is highly trans transmis transmissible for human contact which is why doctors have advised people to practice uh, social distancing to start that it spread uh, there's the girl there looking fabulous of course a blogger during Paris Fashion Week Paris France stopped uh, all gatherings for more than 5,000 people but this had only a small effect on proceedings with some cocktail events and few shows cancelled Jesus Christ yeah there's been a lot of that I've heard a lot of stories of uh, after parties in Paris and stuff still going on people still attending them people having lines and shit drinking it's just like <sighs> Mamma mia, man. The amount of reckless... And again, I, I don't know if it's because people are just like thinking it's a common cold thing or it's something that's going to pass and it's not a bigger deal, but I don't know, man. I look at this stuff and I don't necessarily see it being something that's going to be rectified soon. I think the the nearest indication that we've got to a solution or to a vaccine, I think they're going to try and find maybe in 2021, right? At the beginning of it. So January next year. So yeah, not a good time at all. Not having hay fever, having hay fever, having allergies now during this coronavirus isn't a good thing because the moment I sneeze, the moment I cough, people look at me like, ah, do you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> so I have to be careful as well to not touch people or go near anyone because they're going to be worried. Anyway, uh, let's continue here. Let's go to some next news. What else do we have here to talk about? So, uh, trainer news, Casablanca and New Balance. So, um, I'm sure some of you might be aware of them because I just have only got hip to them now at the moment. But Casablanca are this new brand. I think they, I think they're only maybe a couple of three years old or something along those kind of lines. And um, I was doing a bit of digging. I found out that the actual founder of Casablanca is actually one of the people that was involved with Le Pompon -Pom back in the day. If you guys remember, do you remember Le Pompon? -Pom? It was this uh, really chic uh, nightclub in Paris that opened up. I'm not sure if it's still around. Uh, I remember um, Andre designed the logo for it, which was really, really cool. I think it was a guy with a hat walking and stuff. Le Pompon Paris, right? Let's see if I can find it here. It was a really cool uh, nightclub. I'm not sure if it's still about. It probably is still about, right? It's a, I'm not sure if... But 
I remember at the time, I think all the Pigal crew were involved in it. And one of the, one of the Pigal founders um, has now started off this new brand called... Uh, this new brand called uh, Casablanca. So this is La Pom Pom. I remember this was during the times of, you know, the heady areas of like, what was that New York club that was... Was it Max's and all that stuff? Like, everyone had like their little kind of local hipster bar that everyone was kind of... Uh, associate with the scene we'll kind of go to and it was kind of the, the requisite place to go to during Paris Fashion Week after parties um, I went there a couple of times too um, this is also during the Teddy Times of Alibi here in London and a few others around so these are kind of this was the kind of bar you know that was, that was focused in again a really amazing place um, very well done uh, very expertly put together I think I sent them a mix back in the day too I've wanted to play there this is obviously a, a picture of Yoon Ambush and stuff uh, DJing there there's the guy from Pigal, one of the and one of the co-founders of uh, Casablanca there on the right, um, and of course just an amazing, you know they really had cool graphics. I like their flyers that they put together, just a really artfully and tastefully done brand uh, or bar, sorry for the better term. So this same guy that ran this brand has now got his own brand called Casablanca, and he's putting together this amazing New Balance that debuted, I think, during the Paris Fashion Week just past. Um, and yeah, they look they look great. They remind me a little bit of the Lanvin Runners. Right, that came out a while that have been out for a while. I'm not sure if you guys have seen them, but these Lanvin tr running shoes, they kind of remind me a little bit of that. I've seen a lot of people during Paris Fashion Week wearing them. I've seen them a lot featured in streetwear style pictures as well. And just generally, you know, they've been a bit of a fan favorite. It seems like um, these shoes here I've got on the screen. They're the Lanvin green running sneakers, um, low top panel technical satin suede sneakers in light green, round toe lace up, blah, blah. Um, you can see them here. They've got like a kind of a, an old Nike runner sort of feel, right? Like a waffle racer sort of vibe. A bit more of a chunky sole. They've obviously been uh, aged uh, on purpose, pre-dyed. They've got some stains on the laces. They've kind of dyed the midsole a little bit. Just in general, just a very, very nice shoe. And for about, what, let's, what's that, $400 or something? $400? Pounds? It's at like $590 in pounds. It'd be pretty cheap. It's a really, really uh, great sneaker, I think. Let me see how much that would be actually in the United Kingdom. Um, it's actually quite a good value for a fairly well-made sneaker that could look good wearing a suit. It's going to look good wearing, you know, some track pants. Um, yeah, it's a very, very versatile trainer. I'm, I'm, I'm a real big fan of it. Let's see if I can get it up on here. Let's see, let's see how much it, you know, price is it. Yeah, so 425 for that shoe, which is far less than what you'd pay for like a Balenciaga. And I'd say it's probably the same level, if not a bit better. The Balenciaga maybe has a little bit less of a... It's probably a little bit less versatile than this trainer, right? You can, there's only so much wears or so many way, so many ways you can wear a Balenciaga Triple S or the kind of you know the sock racer. Whereas this, I feel like you can, like I'm saying, mention it before. You can wear it with some light like, linen trousers, some suit trousers, some tailored trousers, some baggy trousers, some pants, um, some track pants, of course. I feel it will look really good. Skinny jeans, whatever you want, right? You can obviously wear it with that. So. Uh, that's obviously a good trainer, but I'm a real big fan of this Casablanca that they've done. It's a New Balance 327, which I'm not too familiar with the model, but I like the shape. I love the over application of it. I like the fact that the toe box, although it's pointy and a bit narrow for my big wide foot, it does look like it might have a bit more whip to it than other shoes do. And just in general, it just looks like a very, very well made, put together uh, collaboration. Um, I would probably lead, I'll probably lean against um, getting the green pair as opposed to the orange pair. I think the green pair is a little bit more of a classic. Uh, kind of um, 80s, 70s runner sort of feel to it. But again, I wouldn't be hard pressed to get either. To be honest, either either colorway, I'd be so happy to have a pair. Um, so the following: so Casablanca New Balance 327 gets the official look. This is from Hypebeast. Says after making its debut at Paris Fashion Week and featuring in the label's uh, Spring Summer uh, 20 campaign, the Casablanca 327. New Balance, sorry, now receives an official imagery. The Sharif Tajir led label, that's his name, right? Shaf, Sha, no, how do you say it? Sharaf, Sharaf Tajir. The Sharaf Tajir label is the first brand to collaborate on the new silhouette. Oh, it's a new silhouette? Okay, it's not a retro, which takes cues from the New Balance's archive of running sneakers from the 1970s. Releasing in two colorways, orange and green, the Casablanca collaboration is inspired by Tajir's dual French and Moroccan heritage, with colors inspired by Moroccan's oranges and tennis uniforms, and the brightly colored detailing sets alongside a white upper inspired by the 70s italian sports car as well as a suede vamp fans and an enlarged leather end on the side walls speaking about the collaboration tajir explained the design perfectly matches the aesthetic of casablanca it's the ultimate leisure shoe it's an honor to the partner 
uh, with uh, New Balance on its exciting new style as a Casablanca's first design collaboration. I know the brand works with few fashion companies, so to be chosen to do this as a new silhouette is so special and unique for me. Definitely. Yeah, it's true, actually. They don't do a lot of fashion collaborations, do they, um, uh, New Balance? They also do some stuff with Junior. He's done some collaborations with them. They've done some stuff with, um, is it Engineered Garments? But they're not really runway stuff. I can't think of many, in it. Margaret Howe maybe has done a New Balance before. Yeah, they don't do many. Yeah, true. I wonder why that is. They could easily do them. I'm sure a lot of brands would want to do them too, but maybe the minimums are to, are a bit high for up and coming brands, which is why people tend to go for under no un well less uh less sexy brands like Asics and stuff, right? Try and make those core, maybe Diodora and stuff like that. But I'm a big fan of this, man. I think it looks fucking beautiful. The imagery as well is really nice. It's got, got this um idealist sort of imagery with their shoes back to back like this. Look great. Again, the side profile is banging. I like the fact that they've got this kind of PU mid mid sewy kind of thing with the two different components here. One bit is a little bit uh, dyed off white than the other bit on the midsole here. I'm not sure if it's different materials. I'm assuming they are. Maybe it's the deal with how they're gonna. Maybe it's a in the inclusion in terms of the heel comfortability. I'm not too sure, but I quite like them. Oh, the sides. I thought the sides were mesh. They're not. It's like a perfect level. Okay, fair enough. I thought it was like a mesh. That would have been pretty cool to have like a mesh on the side, but it's more of like a perfect leather with the massive um, enlarged end on the side. You've got these nice gold uh, lace tips as well. Uh, the laces look a little bit more thicker than what I would be, with what you may be used to, to a new balance. And again, just a very classic shoe, man. Like, I love them. I'm a really big fan of them. Again, I won't be too fussed about getting either colorway, but I'd probably opt to go for the green. I quite like the green aesthetic. It looks really, really beautiful. And again, just a very, very well done collaboration. So let's continue here with the information. Uh, take a look at the silhouette. Um, expected to release globally via the New Balance web store. Okay, April eight, April sorry, April fourth. So it doesn't look like they're going to do anything special for the release. Maybe they'll be released online to at Casablanca's web store. That'll be pretty. Um, that make that would make more sense, wouldn't it? But it looks like for the most part, you're going to be able to get them from the New Balance online store. Maybe some a few other retailers might spark them. And again, maybe they weren't too aware of how popular they'd be. They thought it'd just be like a little release they put out. But it's cool to see them doing this. Um, I'm a big fan of collaborations done. And again, I like the fact that there's no end on the instep. That's quite cool. I'm a big fan of the of the collaboration where the brand, where the you know the shoe brand goes to the other fashion company and says, "Hey, we got this new silhouette. We want to put out. Do what you want with it, and then we're going to release it as the first ever one." I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think the retro thing of it is a bit dead. It's a bit meh. But I think if you can try and introduce a new model with a brand that makes sense for that model to a new audience and get that kind of crossover appeal and be able to attract two audiences, the quote unquote sneakheads anyway, that are going to buy it regards because they're fans of New Balance. And you also got the ability to grab a hold of some of the brand, some of the brands, some of that fashion brands are consumer base and in general, some of the fashion fans in general and bring them on that journey. I think it's a really, really cool idea. I'm a big fan of it. I'm a really, really big fan of it. Um, again, some cool imagery here. Obviously, you got the oranges and shit um, there with the imagery of a person sitting down, some nice trousers here with an amazing little uh, panel on the side there as well. Look at linen trousers or silk. Again, um, very a very luxurious shoe for a company that's not very known. That's a that's thing that's very well done about it. For a company that's not very well known for luxury, like you don't really think of, you don't really think of New Balance. New Balance, you maybe think of it being, um, you may think of it being, uh, how do you call it, um, functional, right? But you don't necessarily think of New Balance being luxurious or exquisite, right? Or refined. You just think of it being like functional, right? A practical, functional shoe that does does what it says on the tin, right? It just gets the job done. If you want to wear it in a pair of royal denims, you can. You want to wear it in some combats, you can. You want to wear it with some chinos, you can. Like It does what it says on the tin. It's just, it is, it's a shoe. But this is the first time they've kind of been able to elevate it without, again, this is the clever part of this collaboration. It's been elevated and made to feel luxe without the inclusion of python or snake skin or, you know, exotic, you know, python hair, uppers or weird colorways just by a really classic, I think someone mentioned it previously. Who was it? I think there's a really interview with Daniel Day-Lewis actually and he mentioned how, um, when he was doing the oh what's the movie called when he's uh he's a fashion designer the one where i think that, that was a movie that's maybe the last one he did actually wasn't it the last movie he actually did was that fashion designer one um he did this movie anyway where he's, he's he basically plays this fictitional fashion designer that's based on uh, a designer called charles james i think right charles james um a very well-known american um old school designer from back in the day very um extravagant 
and over the top and all that stuff. And it was just, and he tried to basically, he had to learn to sew because Daniel Lewis, if you know anything about his characters that he plays in movies, when he plays them, he doesn't just play them via the script. He embodies the entire character, right? Um, if he's going to play a cobbler, he'd go and learn how to actually make shoes. If he's going to go play somebody that, you know, works on an oil field or land, I mean, he'd go and actually. Um, read interviews or biographies of people that worked in the industry and actually go and do that job so he did the same thing with fashion he learned to sew and then he i think he picked up a balenciaga dress or something a very famous dress from balenciaga and he tried to remake it just by uh, the picture because he couldn't get a hold of the actual um, archive item because it was in i think it was in a i think it was in a museum somewhere in paris and they wouldn't obviously send it to him so he had to just remake this whole outfit or this whole dress just from pictures that he found online and he was able to do it but i think what he realized straight away was that the dress from the naked eye looks very simple and very easy to do, right? The patterns don't look that complex, but the moment you start digging into it, you start to find all these complexities into it. And in complexities, complex, yeah, complexities, yeah? you should have said complex elements are demonstrated with this dress, right? And you remember he mentioned something along the lines of like, oh, he, he realized that to make something look simple, to make something look, you know, simple is actually the height of, 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 uh, is the height of that level of craft, right? That's where you're really operating at a high level. You made it look really easy, but it's not easy. Um, and I think that's what the New Balance have done with this trainer. They've made something that looks very luxurious, very high-end, without doing all the common high-end things that people do when they want to make stuff luxurious. And yeah, I'm a big fan of it. E eager to see what we're going to see next time coming around with the collaborations. I think if they are trying, or maybe this is going to be their fashion-based their fashion -based model. We're interested to see what other brands do with it, how they take it. You know, uh, maybe some Japanese brands might take it upon themselves. Maybe you might see a John Lu, uh, no, sorry, a Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Anderson do something similar with this too. That'd be pretty cool with this whole model. Again, I think it's a very versatile. It can work for a few brands, or quite a lot of brands, sorry. And we get to see what people do with it. So again, um, release date is set for April fourth, I think. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for these on the New Balance web store when they drop. Yeah, very, 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 very good sneaker, man. I'm a big, big fan of it. Looks fucking beautiful. So let's move here. What else we have on the list here to talk about? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, North Face and Supreme have collaborated and they've just dropped their lookbook as well for that. Um, I'm not too sure if people care about the North Face and Supreme collaborations that much, but I still think they're probably one of the best parts of the North, of the Supreme drop, uh, whether it's spring, summer, or fall. I think if you look at it from the outside in, you've got the ability every year if you want to, because I think a lot of the jackets from the North Face and Supreme hang around the shops a lot, a lot longer than you would think, especially if you go to the retail stores, if you've got access to go to them. I think you should definitely pop in. And what you've got the ability to do every year is get two pieces, or especially, yeah, yeah, from spring, summer, full winter, you've got the ability to buy on two different occasions a uh, one of a kind Supreme and North Face, or as a one of a kind Supreme jacket or accessory that won't be available on there. Because that, that's the thing they do really well. Supreme are very, or I don't know if they, who works with it or who decides, but they're very strict about never kind of dropping. Uh, the same sort of colorway or pattern of a Supreme collaboration. I think the only thing we've seen that's close to it has been maybe that leaf camo jacket and that red noopsie from that same season too, right? There was a there was that season where they had the noopsie in like the leaf camo and also had it in the orange, right? And I remember then a couple of seasons later, they released their own noopsie, North Face did, with the same sort of like block pattern of like the black on the top and the orange on the bottom. So that's the only time I've seen it happening and they released something similar to the kind of uh, the leaf one. But they haven't so far done a polka dot. They haven't done necessarily like a cheetah print leopard one like the famous one that Drake wore in that video. They've not done low, they've not done even the, you know, the crinkly paper one that just released now. They've not done the pony hair one. That, uh, sorry, the fur one that I have. There's a lot that have come out that they haven't really copied. So I think that's a really good thing. So if you do actually get a Supreme and North Face collaboration, you know for sure, they're not going to they're not going to bring it out as a general release, you know, a couple of uh, weeks later after the fact. So that's a really cool thing to know. So this collaboration has just been announced. It's going to drop, I think, this Thursday. So that's why I probably announced it. So the following. Supreme has teamed up with North Face on a new collection for the Spring Summer 20 collection. Uh, the collection consists of an RTG jacket, vest and RTG fleece jacket, RTG turtleneck, tee, backpack, utility pouch and 
balaclava. I'm assuming RTG is a range, right? That they use. Um, made extremely for Supreme. The RTG jacket and vest features a waterproof, fully uh, seam sealed Gore Tex line uh, nylon jacket with a removable waterproof and hydration compatible Gore Tex nylon utility vest. The RTG backpack and utility pouch feature the durable, water resistant nylon with Cordura yarn, which obviously is everyone's. I think that those Cordura little pouches and stuff and waste bags, they fly out uh, whenever they're in Supreme. So definitely grab a hold of those because they last. You know, I've still got one from like. I don't know, I bought in 2005 or something that I still have it. It just, you know, it does not die, man. It bulletproof those things. The backpack features a removable front compartment with a side zip. It's going to be available in Supreme stores online uh, March the 12th, and it's available in Japan stores uh, and online on March the 14th. So definitely check that out. It's some pictures of it looking pretty cool. I think they're utilizing a lot of their Parisian models, right? I'm assuming these guys are from the Paris store. Um, which is pretty cool to see them kind of utilizing those basic models maybe to kind of uh, freshen up a bit from all the times they've used the same old models from new york and stuff but the north face archive man it's just insane isn't it i'm sure this is not like a, a, a i'm not sure if this is a, a newer model i don't think it is i think it's something they pulled out from the archive and did and kind of brought back but it's so great and again the full face is good too because they probably don't want to take a risk and bring something back that no one buys in the store right because north face as a company is gonna manufacture i don't know like a million units of that one jacket right and they can't risk not selling any so if they have the ability to kind of introduce a new introduce an old item to a new market and use supreme's platform to kind of speak to those kind of kids get it sold out get them acknowledging it and then re-release the entire collection online as a kind of inline thing as a gr with not the same colorway i think that would be it's a great clever idea really it kind of works for both parties supreme get the ability to make these really highly technical jackets uh with the, one of the best manufacturers out in the market and then north face obviously gets the ability to kind of talk to the cool kids um but again i'm, I'm also curious to see how long this collaboration lasts because the output from Supreme in terms of outerwear, especially in terms of like uh, waterproof, Gore-Tex, water resistant uh, uppers or kind of, you know, outer jackets that they've kind of made in the last few years. There's definitely been an increase. There's definitely been an increase in their ability or there's definitely been um, an expansion in terms of what they offer in terms of outerwear. They've definitely delved a lot into down jackets. There's been a lot more of that kind of stuff. So maybe it might reach a point where Supreme finally just starts doing everything in-house. Or maybe has, uh, or maybe works with North Face in the kind of same capacity that they work with, um, uh, what they call is it Raining Champs? What's the brand called that they made in the sweatsuit back in the day in Canada? Yeah, you know I mean, it might be something similar to that. They might just bring North Face in house and have them make like white label jackets and shit. But in general, I'm a big fan of it. I think it looks pretty cool. The vest, I'm assuming, attaches to the jacket itself, right? So you can wear it sort of on top. You've also got fleece as well there, it looks fucking banging. With a nice little pocket at the back there, which looks really great. It comes in all black as well. With a nice little pouch. You got this little turtleneck. But yeah, it looks fucking cool, man. Backpack. Oh, I love the the kid with the massive Jesus uh, cross there. It looks really cool. And a t-shirt too. With a print of the vest on the front. The face mask. But yeah, really, really great jacket. Big fan of it. I'm not, I'm not sure what the RTG thing stands for. Uh, maybe rugged technical gear or something. I'm not too sure. But yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of it so far. I think it looks really, really great. I'm sure it's going to all sell out um, quickly, sooner rather than later. I'm assuming the, the red colorway is going to go. Anything, anything the models wear in the, in the videos or in the pictures always go first. So I'm assuming red and that neon green colorway will go first. And then all the rest of them will follow. I'm assume so. I assume so. That's why I assume. Um, but yeah, really cool collaboration. I like the look of it all. Uh, the fleece is very, very nice as well, actually. I like the actual addition of the little uh, overlay, little gray overlays in the pocket. So it's really chill as well. And again, you've got the only benefit of always having the logo showing so people can know that what you're wearing isn't the common average thing. And they've got gloves as well. The face mark has got a little kind of, just like a, is that Sub-Zero from uh, Mortal Kombat sort of thing on the front as well. That's pretty cool. But yeah, big fan of it all. I think it looks amazing. Um, again, if you're a fan of Supreme, definitely check it out this Thursday when it drops. Let's move on. What else we have here to talk about? Uh, Anna Winter has something to say. Let's do what Anna Winter was talking about. Anna Winter did this video. Where she shares her fashion month favorites and go to interview questions in Go Ask Anna. This is an article from Vogue. I'm not sure how how interesting this is going to be, but let's have a look at what Anna Wintour is talking about. Uh, interesting character in fashion, isn't it? It's weird that she exists, isn't it, still, isn't it? Again, that's why I said before, I think fashion is probably the only industry where gatekeepers still exist, where this sort of like steely looking uh, Caucasian lady with a bob and massive shades that, you know, don't fit her head 
can sit there steely faced and give you the kind of dead fashion stare and sort of like make or break your career it's probably the only industry that still happens maybe the art world is similar too there's not a lot of people kind of breaking the mold in the art world a lot of this i'm assuming a lot of contemporary artists a lot of people studying fine art in university and colleges still want to be represented by a gallery or or like a you know a superstar curator or influencer or somebody of that like or kind of you know a taste maker in a scene i don't know if there's a lot of people or a lot of kids out there who are organizing and making their rec centers remember aaron bondroff he made that rec center uh in new york when he kind of stopped doing a New York thing and he made that kind of like all-encompassing house where people could come in and perform gigs and record podcasts and all that sort of shit. Um, it'd be cool if a lot more kids did that, right? As opposed to like signing up to a gallery and stuff. But, you know, everyone's got their own interests to kind of abide by. But yeah, this is the video with Anna Winter talking about some of her fashion favorites. Let's hear what she has to say and then we can comment on it as we go, right? Let's bring the sound a bit, put it up, right? Do get up in the screen. Hopefully, you can see that now. Let's play this and see what I should say. So, I should say, Hey, Anna, right? Oh, hi. I want to say, Hey, Anna, look at this. Hey, Anna. Did you just feel it in London? Joking. See, look at how scared everyone is at her, man. Maybe we can cut. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Just a woman hi, like everyone Anna. else. My question for you is What is your favorite? lunch break spot during paris fashion week and what do you order Jeez. of course uh the great Gigi hadid there coming off the back of you know absolutely eviscerating uh is it jake paul yeah jake paul so a favorite lunch spot for anna winter let's find out who has time for lunch <laughs> hey anna um i was wondering um why did you like so much playing tennis and uh, what does it bring in your daily life? Marine, uh, because... She doesn't play tennis now, though, it? She looks very frail and very... You know, that's the one thing you've seen with her growing up with fashion. You, do, you have seen her get considerably older looking, but I also do like the fact that she doesn't try and, you know, uh, get work done and tons of plastic surgery pull her face back. She looks very graceful. She, looks like, she reminds me of, like, Anna De La Russa, right? Um, older ladies who have kind of accepted that they're getting older and also kind of leaned into it. I think that's quite nice. It's quite cute. Um, it's quite sexy. And it does... It's very different, too. You can definitely spot somebody that looks their age as opposed to somebody else that doesn't because their face isn't, you know, pulled back. They don't have that shiny look. They, they don't have those pouty lips that are obviously full of fillers. It's really cool to see, actually. Um, let's continue. Because professional tennis players like yourself make it look so easy... Amateurs like me step onto the court full of hope and expectation that we can uh, serve like Serena or return like Roger, and of course that never happens. But I live in perpetual hope, and of course I'd love to play tennis with you anytime. Hey Anna, if you had to give a letter grade to the American, European, and Asian fashion industries on their progress as it pertains to diversity in the past five years, what grade will each one receive and why? Kirby, there's no question in my mind that America is leading the way in terms of representation on the runway. And I think we have yourself to thank and Virgil and Telfar and many other designers that work uh, both in New York and LA. But the influence is also being felt in Europe. Look at the recent shows of Pier Paolo at Valentino or Ricardo at Burberry. And, and more recently, I felt that Sylvia Fendi also had wonderful representation on the runway. So don't you think representation and conversation is very weird in fashion? Like fashion similar to like, it's like, um, it's like having, a, imagine talking about representation in music. Imagine that being a thing. Oh, we're not representing stuff in music. Like what would that even mean? Does that mean that the artists would have to, would that mean that you'd have to have certain artists from certain races have to make certain music in order to kind of rep get represented? Like, would you have to have black artists included in rock and roll, even though they don't want to do it? Would the same way be done with some white artists who don't want to do it? Like, it doesn't make any sense, really, does it? Fashion is clothes. Clothes are worn by everybody. Everyone's into fashion. Everyone's into clothes. Um, brands should, at the very least, right, have their clothes mirror either, I don't know, a segment of society that they want to be part of or mirror their kind of, you know, uh, mirror their, what you call it, mirror the people that are actually buying the brand. I can think of just one example straight off the top of my head because of the Casablanca thing. Like, obviously, the Casablanca brand that, you know, the, this guy that used to be part of Big Gal was now launched with a new balance collection I spoke about previously. Um, you can obviously see the, the inspiration behind that, right? 
It's this kind of like this dual national, this dual uh, citizenship that he has. Uh, you know, his parents are from Morocco, but he was brought up in Paris. The fact that he grew up and was surrounded by all the glitz and glam of the Parisian kind of fashion scene, but he's also got ties to you know his home country, North Africa. The fact that you know there's Casablanca's got a very luxurious sort of like ephemeral rock star Hollywood sort of uh, vibe to it that you can kind of lean into with a kind of Parisian chic. There's obviously some there's something representational in it, right? in the fact that it's what he's inspired by. So when you see the lookbook of Casablanca, you see people walking on a runway, they look exactly like what you'd imagine a brand to be like. So sometimes when these brands, the thing that annoys me sometimes with diversity question, isn't that they should have X amount of black, Asian, you know, whatever people walking down the runway. It's the fact that the people walking down the runway should look like the people that buy your brand because in general, they're the ones that are going to keep buying it, right? That's why I never understood why a brand like Berluti, a brand like um i don't know maybe fendi's even a good example where they have like 18 year old kids with like rosy colored cheek walking down their runway when most of the stuff they're selling is going to be north of a thousand pounds for like one item right and those kids are not going to buy it so why not have people on the runway who look like your actual customers now i'm not telling you to go and get you know some overweight guy from you know dubai to walk down the runway right and just waddling down there but have at least somebody that looks like some of, of the region that that guy's from because he's the one that's actually keeping your brand alive he's the one that's going to liberties and buying out the entire brand or going to your you know your actual uh, flagship store somewhere in west london so this idea that you know that you wouldn't have people that actually wear your brand or the people that look like the people that wear your brand walking down the runway is weird. The fact that you'd have this weird conversation about, oh yeah, Pierre Paolo had some really good diversity. He had four black girls on the runway. It's like, what? What does this even mean? Like, who's he designing for? What language is he speaking? Uh, where's his inspiration based on? And then you kind of have your models uh, uh, represent what those kind of inspirations are about. Less about sitting there and kind of trying to tick off a list of kind of you know it's, it's like as if you've got all these emojis or flags and you're trying to tick as many off as you can so you can get down to the magical number of having over 50 percent representation it's a bit strange i never understand that fashion is again it's one of the only industries where there's gatekeepers and one of the only industries where people say with a straight face oh we have a diverse show this week or this month because or this season because we had four black girls and three asian dudes it's like what the fuck are you talking about so there's no question that diversity is on everybody's mind within the fashion industry and mind. way beyond. It's not in my mind. I good clothes. Hi, Anna. It's Kate. If you could have dinner with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Kate, at a time when America seems politically and they were how, divided, being held hostage, didn't they? I think it would be <laughs> very interesting and very helpful to have dinner with two men who stood for unity and common ground and belief in bringing people together and the two people i would choose would be nelson Donald Mandela Trump. and dr king hi anna if oh, i were I an intern what Someone would you make people. me do alessandro there is hi anna if i were an intern what would you make me do alessandro there is absolutely no question in my mind i would happily step down and let you run vogue Hi Anna, okay. this season I was inspired by the Irish playwright Sims' work, Rise to the Sea, and I wanted to know what play have you found very inspiring? Simon, I was lucky enough to find one night during British nice. Fashion Week to go to the theatre, and I chose to see Tom Stoppard's Leopold Start, and it's an absolutely epic night at the theatre. Every single person in the audience was... I wonder if um, the kids coming up nowadays are actually interested in the arts as much as the generation that came before them or the few ones that came before that. Because I think that's what, when you when you hear someone like a John Galliano speak about fashion, it rarely is just about the clothes. It's always about more than the clothes. It's about the books he's read, the films he's watched, the places he went to go see, uh, the places he's traveled, the people he sees on the street. It's a lot of stuff outside of the industry of making clothes that informs the clothes he actually makes and makes it more interesting, right? They say, uh, what, what's that phrase? What's that, what's that quote about um, to be an interesting person, you have to be interested in things, right? Some, I think a, a very famous acting coach said it to somebody once. And I think that's very, very much something that could be attributed to fashion, to music, or to any creative endeavor. To do the actual best work and to actually say something interesting, have something interesting to say would be to actually try and be interested in various aspects of the arts. And, you know, you never know where inspiration can come from. Um, from those different areas but again I don't know if kids nowadays are because again maybe there is a generation of children or generation of younger kids who are going to like alternative um, kind of underground plays and kind of theatre performances and you know all that sort of stuff but are they seeing the classics you know um, 
are they going to the actual, you know, kind of stuffy, fuddy duddy uh, theatres and going to watch the actual classic, classic, classics and trying to get that to inform their vision of fashion, especially through their young people's eyes? I don't know. I don't know. But I hope that is a thing because I think that's what makes them interesting. Uh, I think that's what makes most people in fashion interesting where they have those, you know, very wide range interests, interests outside of clothes. Sobbing at some point because it really touches on so many haunting subjects such as the Holocaust and the camps and losing and finding your family. Hey, Anna, what is the last thing that made you laugh out loud? So the first thing that made me laugh out loud was Josh O'Connor's wonderful performance as Mr. Elton in Autumn to Wilde's Emma. And the second thing was James Corden and Justin Bieber dancing off against very, very talented toddlers. Hey Anna, I hope you're well. If you're president for the day, what would you do? Sadly, because I was born in England, I can never be president. Of course. Hi Anna, what keeps you up at night? Well, obviously this is a moment of great transformation and challenges for the fashion industry and indeed the world at large. So, in that respect, there are opportunities. I think it's a moment for creativity and resetting and thinking about how we all go about our jobs in a completely different way. But I also think it's our responsibility at Condé Nast and specifically at Vogue to think how we can support each other, how we can support all the young talent that we work so closely with how we can be good partners uh, with all the different companies that we work so closely with, how we can reach and discuss with our audiences how they're feeling to build our community, uh, to be even more impactful and aligned with the way that things are, are going. So I, I think we need to be a leader, we need to be a friend, and we need to be constantly ready to change. That's quite cool, man. That she's too obviously, you know, super passionate about fashion still, isn't it? At this age, in this era, she's still not tired of it. Because, you know, the first thing you'd think of is like, why she just retire and just enjoy her riches, you know, and sit back and become, you know, the the quote unquote, you know, uh martyr that she already is in general, isn't it? That'd be pretty cool. But she obviously still gives a shit about fashion and cares about it deeply. So that's pretty cool to see. And again, is there anyone out there that could really do a better job than her now at the moment with, you know, the beast that is Vogue fashion or that is Vogue magazine? Um, you know, the, the breadth it covers, um, the place it has in the industry still, I don't know. Uh, but I still, it's still cool to see somebody that's at her stage in life, that's done all that she's done, accomplished what she's accomplished, that still has this fire to, you know, connect with the younger generation, uh, acknowledge them, give them a platform, and of course, kind of lead by example. Because I still think, you know, she is probably one of the most interesting people in fashion. Uh, you'd love to, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be caught dead. Uh, talking to her in a cocktail party, right? Especially if you're an up and coming person, you want to like not want to be anywhere near her because you want to say nothing stupid. But it also might be a great time. It also would be the best person to speak to too on your way to fashion stardom because she could probably give you some jewels that you would not be aware of previously due to her kind of you know extensive experience. So again, a really interesting person, somebody that I think a lot of people should take more uh, heed to. And again, I'll link the show to in the show notes. I won't watch the whole thing because it's a bit long, but it's a really cool little interview there to check out if you're that way inclined. Let's move on. Uh, let's go here. Let's talk about clo okay, clothing. Let's go to uh let's go to this one because I think this might be interesting for a few of my listeners who listen to the show. Let's put this up here so I know which one I'm talking about. Boom, boom, boom. So, um, Virgil Abloh has just announced or just uh, launched actually the Louis Vuitton and Nigo collaboration that was kind of uh, that was kind of teased earlier on. This in the season, we kind of got a picture of Virgil and Nigo hanging out, and it was kind of you know Louis Vuitton and Nigo coming very soon, which is a very cool uh, collab and. I think if you, of course, if you're familiar with Virgil, you know he's got extensive experience, extensive history within streetwear. You also know that he's been somebody that's been a a, a big fan, a big champion of Nigo. I think for the most part, a lot of streetwear brand, a lot of streetwear designers, a lot of streetwear um, kind of uh, peeps, industry professionals would probably hold Hiroshi Fujiwara and Nigo as 
at the same sort of level in terms of people to kind of look up to and aspire to be, right? They've all both been able to kind of rewrite the playbook in terms of what it means to be a streetwear designer. Uh, they've also been able to kind of dabble into different aspects of design, of architecture, um, of clothing, of electronics, collaboration, whatever, right? They've designed everything from cafes to cafe cups to backpacks to, you know, um, seller tape, like everything under the sun, they've been able to kind of dab their finger in. I think for the most part, most streetwear individuals or professionals are generalists like I am. I mean, for the most part, we don't really have a precise and exact skill. So streetwear is a kind of natural home or natural kind of um, learning or testing ground for you to kind of discover the things that you're interested in or not interested in, you know, for... Um, I think in that regard you can kind of design you can kind of start your brand and essentially kind of segue that brand into a way to kind of display your creative talents and then use those as opportunities to kind of pursue your other approach on the side whether it's furniture design whether it's art whether it's graphic design whatever you can do you can usually do it from the kind of remit of streetwear and obviously no bigger example no better example than, it, than Nigo in recent years who's now kind of uh, jumped off the Abavian Ape train and sort of gone head first in his human made um, brand which I didn't know having spoken spoken about in the interview here with Virgil that he said that supposedly the entire uh, Nigo uh, the entire human 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 made uh, brand is essentially housed under one roof it's a completely vertical brand where it starts from ideation to essentially production all in one building which is pretty incredible but again you shouldn't be surprised with a Japanese brand that they do things to that kind of level so they shared the entire collection that Nigo's doing with Louis Vuitton it's called Louis Vuitton 2 or Louis Vuitton squared um, that's the kind of label that they're kind of running with uh, with the stuff they're doing with uh, Nigo and Virg and Louis Vuitton for instance and again this comes off the back of the big collaboration Louis Vuitton did with Supreme uh, that was I think that was that the last collection that Kim Jones did, or was that there was one before after that? I'm not too sure, but the last kind of big streetwear kind of collaboration they did with the um, Louis Vuitton. And again, I just think this new collaboration is expertly done. They've kind of thrown the, the they've kind of thrown expectation out the window and sort of like leaned more into tailoring as opposed to the kind of quiet quote because the quintessential streetwear items like coach jackets and varsity jackets and bomber jackets, which they could probably easily do, and they've kind of gone into the more tailored uh, items which have kind of come out really really good um so this article here from vogue that quickly interviewed virgil speaks about the collaboration and uh and some kind of insights into his streetwear dead comments so the title says the following here virgil shows pics shares pics of the his louis vuitton square collaboration with nigo and clarifies the streetwear dead comment um so this is some of the images here uh here's the text of the article and again i'll link it in the show notes for you guys to read it yourselves so this is the following here when Virgil announced his Louis Vuitton collaboration with Nigo in December, he gave props to the Japanese streetwear pioneer. Me being at Louis Vuitton is directly attributed to Nigo's work. Nigo's done work in the past, sorry. Ablo said, um, a collab project with him, it puts his work in the right context, which is definitely true. And again, that's something that you could always, you know, it, there's a lot of negative things said about Virgil, but one thing you can't not say about him is that he definitely uses his platform in order to kind of amplify the voice of people who have come before him and the people that are going to come after him. Um, that's something that again he's always paying it forward always paying it back and I think that really helps to kind of keep the scene alive because for the again because there's a lot of people within streetwear themselves a lot of professionals a lot of brand owners a lot of you know uh, marketing guys and that stuff who I've spoken to in the past who have a lot of bad things to say about Virgil but then when they meet him in real life they're all like you know jacking him off and trying to get a pair of off-whites and trying to get a pair of uh, free off-whites from, like, from him and stuff but a lot of those guys would even the, the haters who are you know hating to his face would have to admit that if he wasn't if he wasn't about you know streetwear might not be where it's at, at the moment it would obviously still be around kids would still be interested in wearing you know jeans and snapback hats and trainers and shit but it would, would it be at the level it is now would merch be at the level it is now with some brands i don't know so we have a lot to thank for him in that respect um so here's the following article it continues here it says the french luxury goods house famously partnered with supreme in 2017 when kim jones was still mvm uh, louis vuitton's menswear designer but his hookup is different uh there are no logos for nigo's brand human made on these clothes and accessories in fact there's not much streetwear in the collection at all let's not do the expected is how virgil characterized interaction between himself and his mentor and friend that rings true with a statement Virgil made uh, for Days Magazine, published shortly after the Louis Vuitton and Nigo project was announced. I would definitely say that it's going to die, you know, like his time will be up, he said, Ablo said, which obviously I didn't agree with. I made a, a video on that too. Um, summed up Streetwear's fate at the time. As an offhand, 
as the comment was see below it stirred up quite a lot of internet talk in industry and beyond the three months later Ablo has some new thoughts on topic and i think i have some of my thoughts too um if you watch this video when i clip it afterwards i'm going to uh, attach a little link somewhere here to the video that they previously talking about virgil's comments so if you want to see that definitely click that but let's continue the interview here it's a say so here's the interview um tell me about your friendship with nigo berg says and here's virgil um he's among the first role mentors i had in fashion uh since my trajectory was different had I been, quote, an unquote traditional designer, I might have gone to New York and apprenticed under Donna Karen. But since streetwear is a new genre of fashion design, those earliest mentors, the Yves Saint Laurent or the Balenciaga of streetwear, is Niga. It's James Jebby who founded Supreme. They took what was organically happening within culture, skate, street brands, and they made hardcore brands from that. Um, Nigo, I was fortunate over 15 years ago to have met him in Japan. He took us under his wing and showed us the ropes of how he was building a, a, the brand at Baby Gap at the time. Um, and again, so again, a good little nod there to James Jebby of Supreme, bigging him up again, bigging up Nigo, telling people to put something into context, history of the brand, and you know, just again, using his platform the good way in order to kind of educate people who are reading it and kind of inform them that, you know, even though I'm doing amazing work now, these people have informed me so you can go and kind of dig in and do your own, do your own research. So the article continues here. Um, when was the uh, when was the what was the process? Sorry, of working with him like. So Virgil says the following: We made his studio in Tokyo. He has a completely vertical fashion brand with human made. In one building, he designs, does the photo shoot, does the manufacturing. I was impressed by that. We had subsequent meetings in my studio in Paris. They were really hands on. Our strong point is the art direction and the concept. What people might not be what people might be surprised by is the is that two guys known for street rate history and, and the ability. The collection is completely opposite. That was our starting point. Let's not do the expected. Let's not put streetwear in a box. That's the epiphany within the collaboration. Um, you're doing a lot of uh, tailoring together. Uh, it says here, and he says, yeah, if you were to say our names uh, that we're doing something at Louis Vuitton, you would almost be uh, able to predict it. But to me, fashion with a capital F is supposed to take you on a journey to lead. Uh, the last four I did an interview where I quote where a quote was taken out of context. My sentiment was that streetwear will die. Virgil Abloh says streetwear is dead. Is that the quote heard around the world, uh, around the fashion world? So he, here's him explaining it. Yeah, I'm such a novice. I don't realize that I can, uh, that fingers can go even that far. I'm a little bit naive in that way. It was literally me in the kitchen just riffing on what had been to, uh, what I'd been thinking. I didn't say it to be polarizing. Eh, I don't know about that. You know, I mean? he comes from the school of Kanye West. He has said some inflammatory things in the past to get clicks and whatever it may be. But I do think the comment was, the reaction to it was a bit OTT. Um, obviously, streetwear, if you've been a fan of streetwear since the beginning or since, you know, its infancy, you will know that it's always goes through these cycles. There's a bit of lulls. You know, Bobby Hundred will write a massive op-ed about the scene dying. Some brand will come out of nowhere and rip Bobby. The brand will pop out of the woodwork. There's stuff happening always at the time, right? Streetwear is always kind of going through this cyclical phase. And it always has these kind of low periods. And the fact that fashion is now kind of fell out loving streetwear, right? Everyone's kind of, the return of tailoring, the return of tailoring, right? Which is kind of like dog whistle code for like, get these fucking skateboard cunts out of our fashion shows, right? Um, that is natural that people would now, because those same people who have now kind of transitioned from streetwear to fashion in order to keep their jobs, they're going to want to say streetwear is dead because they want to, you know, stay within their fashion school. So I get that. Stay within their fashion, with their new, fa new fashion friends, you know, because... And imagine if you're a streetwear head and you've been used to, you know, buying your own beers for your store launches and stuff on a Thursday to then go to fashion where, you know, you get the benefit of, you know, uh, collaborating with Diageo or something on, on the launch of an event. It definitely would be more comforting to go there where there's loads more girls. If you're into girls, there's a lot more glitz and glamour, a lot more money, right? A lot more longevity maybe in that regard because, you know, uh, for the most part, you have a job for life in fashion. Streetwear can be a little bit fickle in that regard. Um a couple of missteps and your brand's completely dead, right? I can think of like Mishka as a good example. Um, so I get the allure of it, but to say streetwear is dead or is going to die, ugh, bit of a stretch. So he says the following here, I didn't say to be polarizing. I think that in the context of the conversation with Nigo, if you speak to anyone that's been in streetwear for more than 15 years, or last 15 years, sorry, it's always had this sort of nine lives, dying and coming back and dying and coming back. There's so many first generation streetwear brands uh stores and retailers the market it wasn't as vibrant as it is now so they went out of business and people don't remember those uh obviously a good example would be the hideout which you know if the, if the hideout was still around now they'll be making money hand over fist for sure especially if they were abreast of all the newer brands and they didn't just try and push neighborhood on kids who don't give a shit about shin takazawa but if they were able to kind of tap into the new brands that are around and sort of like get that going it'll be nuts uh the market wasn't vibrant nigo had nigo's had has had projects before 
It's had many a brand, many identities within streetwear. Partially, what I meant was that it will die, is that new things will cut, will like tailoring from guys like Nigo and me will be born for the regeneration of it. Uh, I don't think you could... <sighs> tailoring isn't going to replace streetwear. Other brands will replace the brands that we know and love now. It is what it is, but tailoring won't replace it. Like, kids are still going to want to wear a, a pullover hoodie, a snapback hat, and some trainers. Do you know what I mean? Like, that is the way it's going to be for a long period of time. Especially if you look at... You only have to look at some of the streetwear style pictures to see that streetwear's influence is still there to be seen in it. Um, back to collaboration. You've put the LV Damir check to good use. It's not something you've d done before, right? He says, yeah, 100%. Um, I thought this was a perfect project to do like, something like this. The mood of the collection started off with our appreciation of the UK dandy culture and the mod era, Savaro tailoring, which obviously is a heavy uh, inspiration of Nigo too, if you're familiar with the stuff he's done with Bape, uh, especially the older stuff in the 90s or early 2000s. Uh, uh, that gave us a silhouette. But when it came to adding our own texture within a silhouette, that was very much using the codes of the house. When I think of Japan, the interviewer says, I think of denim. You've done some amazing things with denim here. What the Japanese are known for is great archiving and reinterpretations of the Americana. Nigo was one of the most formidable collections. He has some of the very early Lee and Levi's pieces that were ever found. His personal style, he's a true connoisseur. He buys outfits on Savile Row. He goes, to the, he goes for the experience, the custom bespoke nature of it all. Um, also, this his collection, his personal collection of denim. When it was a matter of developing his pieces, I thought that was the uh, most authentic using him as a muse. So his influence is in the bags. Uh, he had his brand called Ice Cream with a drippy signature. I thought, what if we made the playfulness of a, a little more serious and merged with Louis Vuitton? And I've seen you've done a hooded bomber with a Mount Fiji on the back. Yeah, we do those projects in our sleep. We didn't want that collection to be 100% that. My program at Louis Vuitton, the overarching vision is the father to son. To, so having a portion of, of more mature pieces to youthful pieces. Let's talk about the LV2 label. Is it applicable to you and Nigo or is it something that you're going to do for, with other people going forward? He said, something for Nigo and me specifically. It's like a new rap group. Nigo came up with the name LV2. We were from we were from outside having an opinion and that's just styling it. We're now inside designing it and styling it. Uh, what says, what's the most important thing you learned from Nigo? In a sense, it's detail, a Japanese precision, but also generosity. He's extremely heartfelt. In an, I'm American and I work a lot in Europe. In Paris, fashion house can be cutthroat. It can have this uh, manic feeling. In America, it's very workhorse. Working with him and having him in the studio, seeing his deposition, deposition and how he has thinking of the challenge and making tailoring and how all and how to refine all these ideas. He did it in a very respectful, calm, polite, but very precise way. Exactly. Absolute ninja, isn't it? So is this a register one-off? Yeah. But as we're finally finished, there's uh, already been talks that this could be ongoing logic. Of course, it's ongoing. If it sells out in minutes, like I'm assuming it will do, they'll keep on pumping it out because, you know, at the end of the day, money wins. So yeah, I think both sides are open to it. So I wouldn't rule that out for other things to come. Uh, I can say that the future will evolve would involve a way of activating this collection when it comes time to release that will be more immersive than just simply putting it out into stores we both have a passion for um eventizing these moments so not just the clothes it's the context and again it's all very well 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 done loads of mod culture elements to it if you're, if you're a big fan of the smiths you'll like this collection uh some great sunglasses some great suits the Damir print, which we haven't seen him done previously, has been reinterpreted there with the drip. Sort of like inspiration from the ice cream logo. Looks very cool there. Some great uh, sunglasses. Great detailing on the... on the Is that an M3B jacket that Nigo's kind of always kind of pumping out there, reinterpreting his own ways. And amazing and valuable does. Actually, maybe that might be the bomber. The bomber jacket here with the, with the Mount Fiji on the back is very well made. That check Damir suit is just absolutely beautiful. And so that side bag... Again, again, the grey looks fucking incredible, doesn't it? Really nice. You've got these uh, metal toe exposed uh, loafers that remind me of, uh, is it Western? I've got that brand. Is it a Western brand that everyone was popping back in the day? You've got this amazing uh, denim outfit here. Is that a chill jacket or denim suit? It's like a denim suit, right? With a sort of like a faux denim, a Damir print with these sort of Wallaby S shoes as well. He's done really well in. Again, the Nigo touch this collection is very evident, very heartfelt, very, very well done. Um, the bags, everything, and that will sell out. They've got an amazing scarf. The logo, the belt is great. Uh, I like the fact that it's been italicized a little bit, a little bit of a swirl at the end of the logo. Looks fucking beautiful. Some nice uh, mountain inspired uh, boots there. Great shirt, troll jacket sort of style looking coat there as well. That would be very popular. The backpack is fucking gorgeous. Nice hat. 
Louis Vuitton Paris. Is that like, kind of like a driving cap, I think? Maybe with, without a strap on the back of it. it. looks really impressive as well. Just all in all, a very, very beautiful and well done collection. I think it's going to absolutely fly out, the, fly out the stores. Again, I'm not I'm not uh, adverse to saying it's better than Supreme Collaboration, but it's definitely up there. Um, they've got some great tassel loafers as well there that look very beautiful and very well done. And just again, very, very artfully done, very well put together. And again, this is going to look even better once uh, the magazines get a, get a hold of them and be able to kind of style it in their own way. I like quite the styling of the lookbook, don't get me wrong, but are you good to see what um, other fashion editors kind of do with this stuff and how they reinterpret it um, in their fashion schedule? So yeah, definitely check this out when it's available. No idea the date so far, but definitely keep your eyes open for that, man. It looks fucking gorgeous, man. Absolutely gorgeous. A big, big fan of it. Wow. Very well done. So that's the Excellence English episode number two. Nine zero, right? Is it two nine zero two eight nine? I forgot one of them. Anyway, don't know what the number is. But regardless, if you're listening via the podcast app, please share this episode with your friends and family. Give me a five star review too whilst you're at it. And if you're watching it via the YouTube app, smash that like button, uh, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below if you have something to say. Right? Um, if you obviously want to get in contact with myself, you want to learn more about me, definitely check out my website, excellentzinger.com, all one word agustinozinga.com all one word check me out there but until then see you guys again very very soon take care bye peace